welcome to Tala Talks Nikki. I'm Dr. Tala and on this channel we talk about neonatal concepts and hopefully try to make them really easy for you to understand. This video is going to be a pretty quick one. I'm just going to go over the three congenital cardiac diseases that may need intervention pretty soon after birth. And when I say intervention, I mean like actually having a procedure done or a surgery rather than kind of starting prostaglandins or just watching for a few days. I know I've brought up this point before, but it's so important that I'm going to bring it up again. Remember that in utero, the baby's heart importantly has to only be able to send blood to the baby's body. It doesn't have to be able to necessarily send a good amount of blood to the lungs as well as a good amount of blood to the body because in utero the placenta does the job of the lungs. So many babies with severe congenital heart defects can grow very appropriately and healthily in utero. The problem comes about after the baby is born where the heart is now responsible for sending blood to both the lungs which have to obviously adequately oxygenate that blood and blood to the body, which hopefully is going to be nice oxygenated blood that the body can use. A lot of times after the baby is born, there might not be kind of like a direct way of blood to get to either the lungs or to the body because there is some sort of obstruction at maybe the aorta or the pulmonary valve. This is where the ductus comes into play. So if we keep the ductus open by using prostaglandins, then we can get blood to either the lungs or the body, depending where the blockage is. The problem is, is sometimes even prostaglandins aren't going to be enough. And this happens in three cases where if I find out that a baby has any of these three issues before the baby is born, then I am definitely alerting cardiology. And if you're not in a place that can do cardiac surgery, then you want the transport team set up and the cardiac surgeons should also know about it. So these are the following three that you really need to have forward planning about. A slight caveat, a lot of times we don't necessarily know that these cardiac disorders are kind of the variation that we need to be most worried about. So sometimes you just find out exactly what's going on with the heart lesions after the baby's born. So the first one is a total anomalous pulmonary venous return where you actually have an obstruction. So a TAPVR is when the pulmonary veins that are coming back from the lungs, they should normally go to the left atrium because remember the lungs are giving the blood a lot of oxygen and then they return it back to the left side of the heart so that the left side of the heart can pump it out to the body. In a TAPVR, the pulmonary veins are not going back to the left atrium at all. They either go back to the superior vena cava, so basically they're draining into the right side of the heart. So if it's a supra-diaphragmatic TAPVR, then generally the pulmonary veins are draining into the superior vena cava and then into the right atrium. If it is an infradiaphragmatic, so below the diaphragm, TAPVR, then that blood is draining into either the IVC, the inferior vena cava, or the hepatic vessels. So you can imagine that if there is all this extra blood basically going back to the right side of the heart, the right side of the heart normally gets really full, and there needs to be a method that this blood can also get to the left side of the heart, because obviously some of it is oxygenated, so it can get to the body. So very often these babies do have ASDs and VSDs as well. A lot of the times, if it is a supra-diaphragmatic TAPVR, then it may take a few days to figure out what's going on. Because if there's enough mixing, then the baby may be getting enough blood going to the body. The problem is, is that if that blood is draining into an IVC or into a hepatic vein, very often there is blockage of those veins. This is what we call an obstructive type of TAPVR. So if the pulmonary veins are kind of completely obstructed, then basically there isn't enough oxygenated blood getting back to the heart at all. And that blood just kind of builds up, builds up, builds up in the lungs and the lungs get really, really wet and don't do their jobs at all. So an obstructed, which is normally an infradiaphragmatic TAPVR, 
pretty much needs very, very quick surgery to relieve those obstructions so that the baby can get oxygenated blood back to the body. The second type of cardiac emergency is the TGA or transposition of the great arteries with an intact atrial septum. So remember, a TGA is when you have the pulmonary artery coming out of the left ventricle and the aorta coming out of the right ventricle. So you kind of have two circuits in series. So blood's coming back from the body and going to the body, blood's coming back from the body and going to the body, or blood's coming back from the lungs and going to the lungs, right? So you have two kind of circuits going around the heart like this. If you don't have enough mixing between them, then you're never going to get oxygenated blood to the body, which, as you can imagine, is an emergency. Interestingly, a ductus does not provide adequate blood flow for there to be mixing. So in a TGA, if you don't have a big enough ASD, or really any ASD, then that baby is going to have a lot of problem and be extremely blue. And this is called a TGA with a restrictive ASD. So when I find out that a baby is going to be born prenatally with a TGA, my first question is, how much blood flow is there through the ASD, through the atrial septal defect, to make sure that there's blood that can cross over to the other chamber? Specifically, we want oxygenated blood getting to the left side of the heart. Sometimes, as you can imagine, we don't know how restrictive that ASD is or whether there really is a hole at all between the two atria. Sometimes, obviously, we don't even know that there was a TGA. So let's say that you get an ultrasound and the baby is really blue and you find that there is a TGA with a restrictive ASD so or no ASD at all. So maybe it's small and there just isn't enough blood going through. Then these babies need to be taken for really normally it's catheterization emergently. So where they'll do an atrial septostomy, where they'll like widen that hole or even create that hole to make sure that there's enough mixing. So that's the kind of emergency number two, a TGA with an intact atrial septum. And cardiac emergency number three is kind of a similar concept to the TGA with the intact atrial septum. And that is a hypoplastic left heart with an intact atrial septum. So remember that a hypoplastic left heart syndrome is when the left ventricle is normally really, really tiny, um, normally because kind of the mitral valve is like stenotic or something or not properly made. And so really the right side of the heart is completely responsible for trying to get that blood to go through to the body. So the blood comes back to the left atrium, it has to kind of get to the right atrium, right ventricle, and then get to the body. So you can imagine that in a hypoplastic left heart, if that atrial septum is intact, so the wall between the left atrium and the right atrium is, is completely made and there isn't a hole in there, then that blood coming back to the left atrium pretty much has nowhere to go. It can't go into the right atrium and the left ventricle is tiny and cannot support the body with getting the blood through there. So again, if a baby with a hypoplastic left heart syndrome has an intact atrial septum, after the baby is born, even sometimes before the baby is born, this babies can get into a lot of trouble because they just can't get that blood out of the left atrium. Luckily, this is one of the few cardiac diseases that can actually be intervened upon prenatally that can kind of really improve the outcomes of these babies. So if there is a baby with a hypoplastic left heart syndrome diagnosed in utero, and it is seen that there is really no hole between the atrium, so the atrium septum is intact, the wall between the two atria is intact, then they can go in, the surgeons and the specialized MFM can go in and can create a hole, almost kind of like catheterization, through the atria so that that hole, the atrial septum is kind of popped open a little bit to allow blood to go through. And this has been a really, really successful procedure. Sometimes the muscle between the atria is so thick that it's difficult to actually create a little hole between it. But most of the time, this really, really helps the outcomes of these babies. Sometimes the baby is born and we didn't know that the atrial septal defect is very restrictive or that, which means that not enough blood was going through or that there isn't an atrial septal defect at all. And in those cases, obviously, again, an absolute emergency 
to try to kind of create that hole or whatever other surgical procedure is decided at that moment to make sure that enough blood can go through to the body. So again, that was the third type of cardiac emergency and that's a hyperplastic left heart syndrome with an intact atrial septum. So again, the three cardiac diseases that I worry about when I'm going to a delivery that I'm not like, okay, well, we'll call cardiology and start prostaglandins and we've got time to take care of it. These three diseases we may have to take care of immediately. That's a TAPVR with a suspected obstruction, number one. Number two, a TGA with an intact atrial septum. And number three, a hyperplastic left heart syndrome with an intact atrial septum. Okay, well, I hope you learned something. Again, thank you so much for being here. If you are interested in all neonatal content, then please remember to subscribe and please like this video. We really appreciate all your comments as well. So if you do write to us, please let us know where you're writing from. We love building this community all over the world. Thank you.